Friends, welcome back. This is part three with my very special guest, HD Tutor, on the special series that we're doing on cults. And uh, even if you're not born in a cult or like I was, or um, you have a cult situation, the reason we've had HG on so many times is because narcissists, cult leaders are inevitably run by narcissists. So whether you're in an abusive relationship or something on maybe a bigger scale like a cult, it's all the same thing. And this man's information has been very valuable in not only putting together a lot of dots in my own life, but he's a, a fan favorite, shall we say, on the channel because of his ability to penetrate narcissism uh, like nobody else, in my opinion. HG, how are you doing today, my man? I'm very well, thank you, Doug. Just call me the penetrator, I think. I That's will, a little... Uh, take that as a, a new title. Okay. We're going to definitely have to R-rate this one, man, at the beginning. I'll be sure to put in the, dis the disclaimer before we uh, get started. <laughs> <laughs> so, friends, this is HG's channel. You definitely have to watch part one and two in order to understand what we're talking about. So I just wanted to show you where to find him and then also the plethora of information that this man offers. So this is his homepage called HG Tutor, the, uh, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra. If you go over here to Playlists, he has, um, so you'll see some of the information that he covers that appertains to uh, cults and the stuff we talk about. Everything from dealing with celebrities um, that may or may not be narcissists, Tina Turner. We know Justin Trudeau, Trudeau absolutely is. I can't stand that guy, HG. Parental <laughs> alienation. You're not alone in that. <laughs> oh, Lord. Thank God I don't live in Canada, man. I feel for those people. Powerful narcissists. Again, more celebrities, um, James Corden, Gwyneth Paltrow. And then right here is where you can find the interviews. So you go to ultra interviews, you click in view full playlist and you can see all these interviews that he's done with many, many different people. And if you scroll down right here, you'll find part one, the seduction of the cult and part two is right here. And then if you go to my channel, we have a whole dedicated playlist for HG. This is the homepage, scroll down to here and you will see series interview with the narcissist HG tutor. And also it's laid out in a way where he was the first guy that um, actually allowed me to interview him and responded right away. I really appreciate that, by the way, HG, because I didn't know You're how welcome, lucky man. I, I got, man. So if you start at number one, uh, we have it laid out in a way where it just leads you through deeper and deeper knowledge. We don't ask the same questions over and over. And you can find um, part one right here, et cetera. So without further ado, of course, you um, lovely ladies and gentlemen have listened to part one and two already. So we're going to pick it up from right where we left off. And this is got... Uh, Part one is called seduction. Part two is called capture and immersion. Part three, which we're going to talk about now, is full immersion. And part four is going to be the escape slash healing process. And again, all I'm doing is telling my story about my family upbringing, how my dad got into Scientology, and like a cancer or a virus, it then spread to the rest of the family, how I got sucked into Scientology, and how I got out, and how it mirrors exactly an abusive relationship. So picking up the storyline, I'm 23 or 24. I had this revelation in a Scientology auditing session one day, and I decide I always wanted to be an actor. They rekindled a purpose during that psychotherapy session. I sold off everything in my landscape company that I had. I had a successful landscape company. I had a girlfriend that we were talking about getting married. And um, I just sold everything and I moved to Hollywood because I wanted to be an actor. So HE, this is where it gets interesting, man, because it's kind of like the lights went out at this point. Again, we're, I'm not gonna repeat anything we already covered because you went into great detail about how everything led up to that. But once I freaking committed to that, and you mentioned, you know, I have the fact that it's my own ideas to take to, take to Scientology. I didn't know anything about manipulation. My parents are into it. I want their freaking love. And mm. so when I commit to it, it seems like everybody's on board. My parents, I moved to LA and I have a place to land. There's a place out here, my friends, called Celebrity Center, which is um, a Scientology place. I call it the Hollywood brainwashing headquarters nowadays. But at the time, I didn't know that. And I had a preset group of people that all were like-minded, where rather than be scared and, it, oh, LA and Hollywood's a big thing, I felt very comfortable because I could hang around the C and B level actors at Celebrity Center. I was on the same page as them because I was a Scientologist, so we were special. And, it, and the reason I say the lights went out is because it didn't seem like anything was wrong, my man, for a good 10 years. Just mm -hmm. to give you, yeah, please jump in whenever you feel like it. 
certainly. Mm -hmm. But that's the whole point, being able to get a hold of somebody, is to ensure that you don't realize that there's anything wrong, because if you do, you're going to fight against it. And the whole point is that human beings are designed to only ever do things which they think are a good idea. You never do something where you wholly believe that it's the wrong thing to do. You're not wired that way. You might have reservations about something, but you still, on balance, regard it as the appropriate and right thing to do. So, for example, a parent might complain about the fact that his son, who's recently moved to the city, keeps asking for money on a monthly basis. And the father says, oh, I'm fairly sure he's spending it on wine, women, and song. I'm not really sure why I keep spending his money. But he still sends it. Why? Because he feels a sense of obligation to support his son whilst he finds his feet in the city. So notwithstanding the fact that he's expressed reservations, he still thinks it's a good idea. And the whole point is that with Scientology, in order to control you and manipulate you, is to make you not only, as we touched on last time, have you believe it was my idea in the first place, but also to ensure that you believe it to be a good idea and so that you're sold on it, so that you don't see anything in the way that we ensnare people in relationships. We sometimes, the less evolved of my kind, throw up some red flags. But invariably, you might see it, but you don't know what it means. And so you remain comfortable with it. Or you think, well, yeah, this person's this, but there's all these other things about them. So you go along with it. You don't react to it. And a lot of the time, people don't even see it. So for you, already uh, listening to it dispassionately, you'd think, right, so you gave up your business just like that. And you've got a girlfriend that you either got rid of or caused to move with you just like that for this cause. And of course, if I was talking to you back then, and I said to you, Doug, what, what, what's going on? Why have you sold your landscaping business? And you go, I've got this brilliant opportunity moving to LA, HG. It's fantastic. I can, I'm going to be an actor. I'm going to do all of this. And, and you've got rid of your girlfriend. Well, at the end of the day, sacrifices have to be made if I'm going to you know, pursue the dream. You're utterly already, as you say, although you've not got into the full immersion, that it started. It's already causing you to jettison things, which years later you look back on and go yeah the lights went out you can see it now and it's just the, such a similar situation to the narcissistic dynamic of drawing somebody in and they're not really seeing what's going on it's exactly like that and you know another thing that uh, it was easy to justify to my friends because like you said hey you know i got this dream i want to be uh an actor and also they didn't know too much about scientology that's the cult we're talking about my friends in case i didn't mention it already um scientology is best known for tom cruise who if he's not one of the biggest movie stars he's certainly at the top and then you take that you take and john travolta and a whole bunch of other people so hg what the fuck could possibly be wrong and here's another thing that really fucked me up when i got out of it if Scientology is a mafia-like criminal organization with uh, convictions all over the world like they are, why on earth did I grow up seeing a Dianetics book on the television? I don't know if you remember, but there was this exploding volcano ad that said mm -hmm. Dianetics, you know? Page 33, learn how to communicate better. Page 55, learn how to... It was a freaking self-help book, and it was like a number yeah. one bestseller at the time. And then they have organizations all over the world you know, like I said, they had this big fancy celebrity se center building, which very reputable people were going to. You could rub mm -hmm. elbows with the stars. And it, so what I'm saying is, if I'm growing up with this is my reality, if my parents are into it, if Tom Cruise and John Travolta in, are into it, it's a number one bestseller. Um, there's organizations all over the world. How is it going to cross my mind that it that, you know, in my 30s, when I wake up out of this, and go down the rabbit hole that it's it, that it's illegal that it's it doing something very criminal why you know why wouldn't it have been shut down so the, even though like you said all the red flags looking back at it now were apparent all the time in mm -hmm. order for me to come to terms with this if i even knew about it it would mean losing my family trying to get them out of it it, it, it would do a whole cognitive dissonance thing like it did in my brain about, well, why didn't the government do anything about it? So you can see, and you mentioned it in the last video, 
about how I basically had no fucking chance because if I did not, I guess the best thing I could have done, HG, is to simply not take to it. And then my parents would be a little bit, I wouldn't be super close to them, but it, that probably would have been acceptable as long as I was quiet about it. But because yeah. I stepped my foot into the fucking thing, I'm pot mm -hmm. committed now. And then if I try to get out, I lose my family because you become a suppressive person if you leave and or talk yeah. out about it. And all, you know, my parents are going to be disappointed because what do you mean, son? You freaking loved it. Now you're saying it's something different. So mm -hmm. it, 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 was there any way, let's say somebody's growing up in a situation like mine where they have a Bible thumping mother and they're pushing, you know, the Bible on them in the same fashion as Scientology with the same adamant, um, you know, uh, son, in order for you to really, you know, be close to me, you need to be close to Jesus or whatever mm -hmm. situation that people might be in because there's very few Scientologists. What would you say to somebody like me or that's in that situation to avoid that? Is there any way to, how would you handle narcissistic parents that are pushing something on you and you want their love, yet you don't have the worldly knowledge yet to suss what's going on? What what, what are your defenses? In a, what, what would have been my defenses in a situation like that? The only defense that you might have would be somebody else trying to intervene on your behalf. Mm. Because as a, as a child or a young adult, first of all, you'll have been immersed in this world from your birth because mm -hmm. your, your your mother or your father were there a narcissist they don't start being a narcissist at the age of 33 right. they were formed as a narcissist before you were even born so from when you came into the world you are dealing with a narcissist from the first time the air enters your lungs and so you don't know anything else so not only do you not know anything else so you've nothing to compare it against yeah the narrative of your world is being fed to you by your primary caregivers who you have evolved to place absolute trust in because when yeah. you were a baby you felt discomfort and you made a noise and one of these people usually anyway comes along and alleviates the pain by soothing you giving you something to eat something to drink course there are some parents that fail in that regard and so somebody else steps in but where they're that that type of functioning narcissist that operates a facade etc most likely mid-range then all you understand is that environment so when first of all how can you spot that something's different and odd if that's all that you ever know and it might be for instance and people do talk about this is that when they start to form friendships and they go around to somebody else's house and they see how they behave compared yeah. to how your household is and you kind of think all oh, right that's a bit different you don't necessarily think that yours is the wrong way you just you might even think theirs is the wrong way oh well, we don't do that in my house that's a bit strange and you go back and of course who are you most likely to confide in? A parent. I went round to Johnny's house and they were allowed to do this and do that. Oh, well, yes, Johnny's mother's the whore of Babylon and that is a, you know, that's a godless house there, yeah. etc. And so it's then drummed into you. Oh, okay, yes, I better not go along with what happens. In, and, and you lack the critical faculty of the child to go, hang on a second, mum. You're talking bullshit here. That doesn't yeah. that doesn't work make sense because your parents are your world. The only instance where you might have some form of defense is if somebody else comes along and says, Doug, your mum and dad are doing such and such. And even then, the chances are slim because in any narcissistic ensnarement, where that person is being ensnared by a narcissist when somebody else comes along and tries to say to them look out you're, you're involved with the narcissist they're more likely to go what are you talking about yeah no this person's great you're just envious of the fact i've got a relationship and they're not ready to understand it so for you when you're getting sucked into all of this you're you're basically the um millennium falcon getting drawn towards the death star by a tractor yeah. beam you ain't getting out of it exactly God damn. You know, that's a great point to uh, bring up this, which you just sparked off. I often get in debates with my friends because narcissism, narcissist, has become so overused that people have a tendency to be numb to it or not think that it means a specific thing. Yeah. I know we've covered this in previous interviews, but just to hammer home, the po hammer home the point, because it does mean something to me. It's not just a word. It means a person who lacks a conscience. They won't have empathy, etc. Would you mind breaking down real quick? what specifically a freaking narcissist is so people know what we're talking sure. about. And well, then... A narcissist is someone who has narcissistic personality disorder, so they don't have any emotional empathy. 
they are usually unaware of what they are. They see the world through a different lens. And that lens is one that their responses when it comes to other people is governed by the need to control people and nullify perceived threats to control. That the narcissist needs fuel, needs a response from people to validate their existence. They believe that, uh, they, in some instances, the narcissist believes that they are somebody that's going to be hugely successful, even though there's no supporting evidence of that. They're an individual that acquires character traits and residual benefits from other people. People are just appliances that are there to be used. Uh, the individual has a limited emotional uh, repertoire compared to non-narcissists. Uh, and the individual basically has a particular defense mechanism which has been created to enable that person, the host, if you will, survive and thrive in a particular way. So that in their interactions with other people, it's all everything revolves around them and their needs. And other people are only there to facilitate those needs. And there's lots of different flavors, of course, of narcissism, and lots of different ways that the narcissism can manifest. But what tends to happen is too often people find that somebody does something that they don't like and they go, oh, that person's a narcissist. Or they've had a relationship that didn't work out and it's, oh, they're a narcissist. And that isn't necessarily the case. There's a lot more to it. You need to look at a lot of behavior over a long period of time and to see that they uh, tick certain boxes in terms of demonstrating a sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability, magical thinking, haughty behaviors, that they show grandiosity, that they're manipulative, um, that there's and lots of indicators about the way that the narcissistic dynamic operates. So those are all of the things that one would look for. And, and too often, that you do get uh, a knee-jerk reaction from some people that then when they're dealing with somebody that does something they don't like. Uh, they think, oh, right, th th that person's a narcissist. And it's the same gaslighting is a phrase that uh, is, uh, or a word, rather, that's being banded around far too often. A lot of people don't really understand what it means. And to gaslight somebody is to affect their reality so that they no longer believe in it. Um, whereas other people think that just being told a lie is being gaslighted. It's not it's uh, far deeper and uh, far more insidious. Thank you for taking the time to break that down. And you know, another thing that people might have hard, a hard to come to terms with that might be difficult, which certainly is for me even to this day. So mothers are wired to take care of their kids, right? Sort of in the uh -huh. DNA. So what I couldn't comprehend and still can't is I could never do that. This is why I didn't have kids HG because I didn't want to fuck my kids up because I knew I was fucked up. I just, couldn't do it i'm like i'll heal heal mm -hmm. myself or whatever that means and then maybe have kids uh, or... that for emotional empathy i don't have children because they're fucking annoying yeah well i mean i would probably agree with you if i had them because it sounds like a <laughs> hell of a responsibility <laughs> and i can barely take care of myself man and i mean trying to get over this shit has been a, a full-time job and like i said yeah. i don't want to do what my parents did to me and i know a lot of people will have kids and do the opposite because their parents mm -hmm. will teach them well i don't want to be fucked up like that i'm going to give them you know i'm going to treat them well or whatever but yeah. this this narcissist um, narcissist, it's not narcissism that being a narcissist, a narcissistic mother overrides somehow this genetic component to take care of the kid. As you said, they put their needs first and I still can't wrap my mind around this concept. How does it override the, the instincts of the mother, man? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a case of overriding it as that it never formed in the first place. So there's no so love. Real love? Yeah, because th th that mother, she became a narcissist. Mm -hmm. So throughout her life, she didn't function with emotional empathy. So it's not a case of it was there and the narcissism somehow squ quashed it. Uh, but rather, there might have been the, the very early grains of emotional empathy because there are, some, there are studies that talk about how babies do seem to show emotional empathy towards uh, other babies, etc., when they're very mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. However, that empathy needs to develop because, as I've mentioned before, there's a newborn baby thinks the world revolves around them. It doesn't consciously think that way, of course, because they're not mm -hmm. thinking. They've not got the words to, to think because they've not learned language. But their appreciation, if we could put it that way, of the world is, I have a pain, this person appears, they make the pain go away. Uh, there's another pain this person appears the pain goes away so the baby 
forms believing that that primary caregiver almost lives in a cupboard and just emerges to soothe, to feed, to uh, cool, to warm, to entertain. And then over time, that baby as a child learns about sharing and consideration and patience and cooperation. It's taught. And there may well be some innate emotional empathy in there, which is uh, like a seed that is cultivated by that caregiver. But if that does not happen, and the genetic predisposition is there towards narcissism, along with the lack of control environment, rather than, if you will, rather than the emotional empathy plant grow, the narcissist plant grows. And so that then, let's say that young girl, she becomes a narcissist, so that when she reaches a point at having a child herself, she has no emotional empathy in order to care for that child. Now, she may have cognitive empathy and of course she may well understand that and remember that that child is but an extension of that narcissist so when that child is crying that child crying is a threat to control of the narcissist so there's several things that that narcissist mother can do she could just walk out of the house and leave the child crying why because she has no sense of conscience or obligation. But her narcissism might be mindful of the fact that if the neighbours hear that and they call the police or social services, that would damage her facade, so she doesn't do that. So she sues the child, not because she cares about the child, but she cares, in essence, about how it makes her look. And also, to shut the child up nullifies the threat to control. So if she sues the child and it stops crying, that threat to control is now gone. It's not done because she cares about the child. It's done because it serves her needs. I know that, for instance, I was advising a client and he faced a situation where his wife, in, in order to assert control over the newborn, created an environment of sensory deprivation for the baby that was basically ensconced in black the whole time. So the little boy didn't know whether it was day or night that he was just plunged into eternal darkness and the father uh, try, uh, looked to put a stop to that because the mother had no emotional empathy and she deemed that was the most appropriate way of dealing with him, saying that that's how he would learn to shut up by being put into silence, by not having an environment around him. She clearly was a narcissist and the, her absence of emotional empathy was being demonstrated there. So that narcissist in the beginning when for, uh, has, uh, has been a narcissist and then become is a narcissist first before becoming a mother, and then either could be one where the child is just an inconvenience and therefore lashes out and abuses the child, stop whining, leave me alone. You know, he's more interested in knocking back the cider than uh, caring for the child. A another one will care for the child, but only because it makes them look good, not because they inherently are obligated to do so by a sense of emotional empathy. Once again, you just described my mother, man. I'm just sitting here listening to you. It's hard to come to reconcile that though, my friend, because there's, there's many things that she did that was positive and good. But like you said, it was all about um, particularly looking good in front of the neighbors. That's what it was all about, my man. It was yeah, all self-serving. You, know, you might argue that it's a little bit like the work that I do. Some would say, uh, some would describe me as an evil individual, but would also then say, well, even though you're doing this for your own needs, HG, you the help. fact is it helps other people. So yeah, bugger the motivation. Okay, yeah. that's one way of looking at it. Other people would say, I still can't countenance accessing his work because of what he is. You are allowed yeah. that opinion. Uh, you're the one that loses out if you don't. That, again, that's your problem, not mine. But similarly with that narcissist parent, it's all about the, the needs of the parent that are served. And whilst that child is an extension, you've all, also... There's the fact of this child's an extension of myself, that subconscious view. Therefore, looking yeah. after it is looking after the extension of the narcissist. It's a little bit yeah. like ensuring that you're looking after your foot so that you can walk. And wow. it's only when the child becomes problematic that the narcissist's 
lack of emotional empathy really shows. Hitherto, oh yeah, this is a nice toy that I'm playing with and it's doing what I want and it's making me look good and um, because it's mine and uh, he's going to grow up and he's going to be the prime minister or he's going to be a, a, a soccer star or she's going to be a fantastic actress or whatever. And then, of course, oh, you're not, do you're not becoming the thing that I want you to become. You're a bad child. You're, you're a naughty child. Uh, and, and the child is lambasted for that because they're not allowed to be independent of the narcissist. They're not allowed That's to correct. forge their own ideas and, and achievements. And then, of course, when the child uh, rails against what that parent wants, then the narcissist rejects them as an extension of themselves because they are no longer useful. You're no child of mine. Um, I, don't, I don't love you. Um, I don't like you right now words that are used against that child to devalue for the purpose of punishment because that child is meant to be not a separate or separate independent individual right. of uh, that is brought up but rather is an extension of the narcissist that is there to to facilitate what the narcissist requires and if that child doesn't do it they're a bad appliance you just reminded me again well why it was inevitable that i found in this fell into scientology you know, I did have a grandmother that was kind of warn me a little bit or planted seeds mm -hmm. that later on in my life did become helpful. And she was somebody, I had a few angels in my life that seemed to be guiding or pointing, but they couldn't, I had to deal with what I had to deal with. I was trapped kind of from day one. But you yeah. know, it's funny that you say that because I never got to individuate. So mm -hmm. I looked at, I realized, I always talk in the videos about how I was kind of a bad child. I was just rebellious. But HG, listening to you talk, man, I'm not trying to justify my behavior. And I often in my brain make it something much more than it was. I really wasn't any worse than any typical rebellious mm. child. I played in, you know, heavy metal bands and shit. And I, uh, you know, got into trouble here and there. But in the videos, I always recount how I was a bad child. I was the black sheep of the family. And my sister mm -hmm. was the golden child, the one that was praised, etc. She actually was way more controlled than I was. Because she did well, they didn't push Scientology on her as much. It was pushed on me because I was the black sheep. Obviously, I need the most help, so I need the most Scientology. But my mother... Yeah, well, um, Scientology will be used as a mechanism to control exactly. you. Exactly, I realize that. Your sister was Absolutely obedient, now. therefore she didn't need it. You were disobedient, yeah. therefore. So in the, in the way that with, with some families, it would be to use physical violence towards you to mm -hmm. control you. Here, it was the use of a, of a cult to control you. Yeah. I have always these new revelations every time we talk, man. You really help put stuff together because I wasn't what was happening, my man, as I was rebelling sub, subconsciously, I knew something was wrong. I wasn't allowed to individuate and I had such a strong desire. I knew who I was kind of popping out of the womb and what I wanted to do. Yeah. <clears throat> but I would always fight my mom, man. And my dad would be there to back her up. I yeah. feel like as we talked about in part one, she had control over the whole family. And my dad may actually be a mm -hmm. victim because he shut down and they, you know, he would defend her and vice versa. But yeah. um, it was that process of never being able to individuate that finally made me succumb to, well, I guess I'll just do subconsciously do what my mom says. And then when I, you know, they wanted me, she wasn't unsupportive of me becoming an actor. She'd be, be there at the speech tournaments in junior high. I would throw up and get super nervous. She would go in with me. She was kind of like, she wasn't even necessarily a stage mother, but she would definitely mm -hmm. take credit for my accomplishments. She lived vicariously yeah. through, through my sister, who was the head cheerleader and successful in her own right. Um, going to be a gymnast, gymnast and all that. Looking back at that, by the way, my mom was kind of happy when my sister broke her leg. She was going to possibly do, go into the Olympics. She was really good, and she broke her leg. And my mom, who was super controlling over her in a different way, was secretly yeah. smirking and happy whenever we kind of failed. I didn't realize yeah. that at the time, but she was, let's just say it's really weird having a mother that's jealous of her own freaking kids. When I did individuate or attempt to, and part of that was moving to LA, at least I got to get away from my family. I was still in Scientology. I was completely controlled from afar, but nonetheless, at least I had some distance so I could pursue my own thing. And even when I finally, nine, 10 years later, finally got on television, I, um, my mom took credit for it, and so did the church, quote unquote. They said, first of all, they were telling me, I'm I'm never going to make it. My mom, even when I freaking was working steadily, my mom's like, when are you going to get a real job or whatever, you know? And I'm like, mom, this is what I'm fucking doing. This is what I starved and suffered for 10 years and, you know, eight, you know, just, it was all about trying to make as an actor. So I sacrificed everything. And then when I finally got a foot in the door, my mom says, 
not only I knew you'd always make it, but that's when I started to get weirded out by the cult and by my parent, my own parents, because I could see their jealousy. They started to act funky towards me. And I was like, what, what do you, I thought you were, I didn't realize how much my mom in particular was living vicariously through me. And she basically mm. would take credit. So it wasn't my doing dude. She actually thought that somehow in her twisted mind, she did the work and she was the one that made it. It was the weirdest thing. So that's when I started to kind of just back yeah. on the story, you, you know, I was under for nine years. I love well, Scientology. Oh yeah. Please jump in my man. Yeah. She, she expects you to do what she requires and she expects you to know what is required of you. Yeah. And if you fail to deliver that, right. that makes you threatening her sense of control, even though she may have been completely vague about what she requires in her world. Yeah. She knows precisely what you ought to be doing. And her grandiosity and magical thinking causes her to believe that she knows what's best for you. Exactly. It's often the case that a narcissist will tell you, I know what I, I know your mind better than you. I know right. you better than you. Because that stems from the, the concept of you being an extension. I know you because what the narcissist is saying, although they don't realize this, is I know you because you are me. You are you are you are part of me. You are an extension of me. And that grandiosity translates into maintaining that you know what that individual is. And by the fact that you're an extension, it means you should automatically also anticipate the needs of the narcissist because the narcissist is the most important person. Exactly. So if you're going off being an actor, you're not anticipating the needs of your mother. And the fact right. is, in her mind, she's thinking, Doug, you ought to know what's right for me because you are, in essence, an extension of me and I'm hugely important. Everything revolves around me. And it's very clear, you you do know what I need. You do know that. And the fact that you don't deliver it means that not only do you know what I need, you are deliberately flouting what is necessary for me. And that wow. means that you, Doug, are a very awful son, that Jesus. you are a terrible human being. Because not, it's not just a case of you didn't know. You knew, and you consciously decided not to follow it. Yeah, That's like I'm a mind reader. Going on. Yeah. And therefore, what then happens is you become painted black because all of that is a threat to control. And then you're punished because not only are you a bad son, but you're a knowingly bad son. Right. Oh, my God. And so I, then oh, something God. like Scientology comes along, and to a narcissist, it provides the narcissist with a wonderful tool Fuck for yeah. controlling other people because, as we've touched on before, religion is one of the biggest devices that narcissists have ever created yes. to allow the mass control of a populace. What, what mightier device is there than an imaginary friend who will strike you down if you say the wrong thing and consign you to being burned in a lake of fire because you didn't do what this person told you to. That do sounds like a narcissist. Yeah. God sounds like a narcissist to me in that version. Yeah. If you don't do and what so I with say. The, with the Scientology, it, 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 it's either do what I say and you'll be granted salvation, greatness, superior knowledge, the spaceship will beam you up and take you to the planet Quark, whatever it will be, <laughs> or don't do what I say and you'll be damned. And you will be cast out and you will uh, be uh, subjected to eternity and uh, having little imps and demons sticking forks in your genitals, whatever it might be. <laughs> That's not too uh, far off it's a, there. It's a, it's a method of levels. control. Because if you think about it, religion is supposedly built upon compassion. Uh, yeah, it's the opposite in most cases. Yeah. It, it's actually there to control. And who is, is it, it that needs control more than anybody else? Narcissist. Narcissists. Like I said, that when you just describe God, and I've thought about this, you know, he died for your our sin. I didn't ever even met the guy. And before I pop out of the womb, there's already a gentleman that died for my sins. I have to do what he says. And it's all kind of vague and shit. The Bible reads like poetry. You know, you have to try to figure it out. And it, it's not like straightforward. I don't know the whole concept of that. Well, uh, and again, um, any, you know, not just the Bible, but any um, religious script, what's it used for? interpretation mm -hmm. and, and what is it that narcissists love to do more than anything else it's the, the humpty dumpty approach uh, of uh, from uh alice through the looking glass of uh, when i use words i know exactly what they oh, mean yeah. basically oh, jesus what i'm stimulating me hg yeah we used, we used i was alice. making earlier that the narcissist 
operates in a world where you are assumed to understand what the narcissist means. Exactly. So a, a preposterous example would be, I could say to you, uh, green eggs and ham. And in my world, I've just told you, Doug, go and get me a pint of beer. And then you, exactly. you, you, you look at me with a blank look and you go, what are you saying, HG? Uh, and I say, uh, where, where's my beer, Doug? And you go, what are you talking about? I just asked you to get me some beer. No, you said green eggs and ham. Well, you should know, Doug, that means go and get me a pint of that particular lager. And you know you know that's the case, Doug. And the fact is you're being deliberately obtuse by not doing it. So the whole point, again, is that a narcissist will come along, whether it's Scientology or some other kind of religion, and use the founding text or scriptures, whatever it might be, and will say... I understand what the God meant. I I am the conduit by which you you receive understanding, grandiosity and magical thinking, haughtiness. And I am going to interpret this for you because then that gives me control. But of course, for the most part, that's done subconsciously. And you see that it's invariably the case, the most extreme examples of religions is where they interpret these texts in a particularly harsh way. And then mm -hmm. they turn on even denominations within their own religion. Yeah, I know. I mean, you get, you get an interesting example of that with Margaret Atwood when she wrote The Handmaid's Tale. And she talks about the sons of Jacob and the fundamentalism that they're born out of. Uh, they turn on Baptists. Uh, you see Baptist churches have been burnt down because their interpretation isn't acceptable to them. So fellow Christians, no, they will turn on them because they have this absolute view. And the way that they behave is all about that control, taking control of women to say, you now are unwomen. You don't even have the status yeah. of women anymore. And as a woman, you're just a chattel of a man that is there to be ritually raped every month for the purpose of producing a child. And so, and what do they do? They interpret, they, they, they say that basically, you know, women aren't allowed to read. Why? Because as it was the case in the, in the, uh, the Middle Ages, that reading increases understanding and leads to the formation of ideas. And so if right. you stop people from having ideas, they're easier to control. How do you stop people having ideas? Don't give them information. Where do most people get information from? From reading. Sure, you can get it from being, from watching and listening. But cozying up with a book and reading it and having your own ideas, that's dangerous to those that need control. Exactly. A couple of points on that. You know, you mentioned Margaret Atwood and The Handmaid's yeah. Tale. Ir irony of ironies, you know, Elizabeth Moss, who is one of the main actresses on that, is yes. in Scientology, second generation Scientologist. Ah, and when she's well, been confronted on that, she's been confronted sometimes too, HG, in interviews about reporters dropping hints that what about Scientology and what you portray, you know, you're in a totalitarian cult and yeah. yet she can't see that because again, we're back to the second generation born in and undoubtedly she has a stage mother slash narcissist mother. That's a total guess. But Elizabeth, like me, I can see that she was cloistered and mm -hmm. uh, her path out would be like a lot of these second generation Scientologists would be really, really devastating because they'd have to undo and unbelieve everything they've ever believed in and go against the parents, the ones that they thought were there to protect mm -hmm. them and to love them that actually set them up since birth. And an, and another thing you mentioned is you reminded me of the eggshell. You're talking about the walking on eggshells, having to anticipate, having to be a freaking mind reader with my mom and L. Ron Hubbard mm -hmm. about what they expect. And when I do what they don't expect, they think somehow in their magical thinking mind, like you said, that I actually know. So in a way, and this kind of played into Scientology's telepathic powers. I did try to get tuned in to my mom. I could read yeah. and feel emotions. And this is where maybe my empathy started to maybe develop or something simply by being in an environment where I have to get tuned in to simply survive. Well, that's right. That's why empaths are, are prime victims and why you suffer the most is because a normal yeah. person does have emotional empathy, but there'll come a point where they, to put it crudely, it's a case of, I'm not really getting this, so sod it. And they, they walk away from it. Yeah, for an yeah. Empath, I wish I was like that. Your empathy man. causes you to want to... Uh, this I, I'm not understanding why this person's treating me this way. I, I need to understand them because I care. Exactly, because that man. person is my friend or is my mother or is my lover or is my husband. Yeah, what's Therefore, wrong with your that? your emotional empathy says, I, I, I need to... to and they are they're experiencing some kind of pain here because they're upset and I don't want to see them upset. 
And so yeah. it's not a case of the empath wanting to control them, but rather thinking, I feel bad because I can see that they're angry and that they're upset and they're hurting. I want to alleviate that. Yeah. And therefore, you're led through your emotional empathy to want to try and interpret yeah. what it is that the narcissist is after. You and then it. sometimes, th through serendipity, you do something which accords with the narcissist's need for control. So you're treated mm -hmm. well. You, you get the, you know, you get the and you don't know why. Treat, yeah. And you don't know why. But it feels so intoxicating Fuck yeah. to be praised by that narcissist and yes, also that, that you're no longer being racked or having uh, spikes shoved under your toenails. Yeah. That the absence of that pain feels so good alongside yes. the praise that yes. it's absolutely intoxicating to an empathic person. Yes. So rather than think, oh, good, I've stopped the pain. Now's my chance to get away. They become, I want more of this. I like to do good. God, I don't know how you describe. I'm just, it's so good to talk to you after a couple of months, my man. I need to check in with you more often because you just have been clarifying a lot. You clarify so much you, I, and, and it also relieves, it causes... It may suck, but understanding is what I'm after because the more I yeah. understand, it alleviates the pain and the mysteries start to go away. And plus you realize, while I say I'm, I'm not perfect or anything, I definitely will realize much of that was just simply not me. That was on my mom and shit. And, yeah. um, you know, do you think that there should be some kind of a test? If you are, anybody can have a child and it's not fair to simply... There's no rules or regulations or anything. And if, if you're I, a narcissist, if, mm -hmm, I, please. If, if I was head of a, some kind of new world order, mm -hmm. one of the things that I would do, it would be to issue a license to breed. Really? But I would have some form of technology that would mean that that individual was rendered sterile until such time as they'd been assessed and passed fit for breeding. And... The reason that I say that is because it fits with my need to control people. But also, I find there are too many people on this planet that I look at, and my natural instinct is, is to want to execute them because they're ill-governed, ill-mannered. They add nothing to the... They add nothing. They're mouth-breathing dullards that are easily... Uh, <laughs> uh, they're easily distracted by bread and circuses and they deplete resources which could come to me instead and it, it isn't it isn't born out of any sense of uh fairness or such like but simply you know you have you you want to drive a car you have to pass a test mm -hmm. you you want to be a doctor you have to pass examinations you aren't allowed to drink alcohol until a certain age you uh, are going to uh, use certain machinery. You need to have certification to do it. And yet, the the one thing that has probably the greatest impact upon this planet yeah. and another human being, they you, it's allowed that anybody can breed. Yeah. And the simple fact is, there are people who shouldn't be breeding. I'm in accord with you on that. I can't, I, I have the same viewpoint, maybe from a different angle, but yeah, I would say the same thing. Yeah. Because so, I mean, so, think that would change the society. Don't you think my man? I mean, I'll, maybe you would. So are you saying you'd want to just, just breed narcissists or what? I mean, you're not saying that. No. Would, you see, <clears throat> I would quite happily get rid of the lower echelon narcissists because I see them as just a waste of space as your, common or garden idiot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i also recognize that we need certain people to do the the menial things that if so if we can't automate it you're always going to need somebody that's going to have to do the dull stuff and and that's why in brave new world they had the right idea there you think so well of course you would Absolutely. because that would be created by a narcissist right i for me that yeah, would be a horror but, because it would but, be ultimate control over everybody right but if you if you're everybody able to the same somebody, and, yeah. If you're able to breed somebody that revels in their revels in the fact that they are there just to do something mundane, they're perfectly content with that. Mm -hmm. That's good for everybody. They have they have no ambition, therefore they can never be uh, envious. 
they're perfectly content. They're not interested in the finer things in life. You know, as the example, the children were conditioned that if they went near a flower, they got an electric yeah. shock or a discordant noise yeah. went off. Yeah. That type of thing. So and they were all in different groups and all the same, and they didn't right. have too much uh, original thought going on in their in their skulls. Yeah, so they were easy to control. You've, you've got to look at you you've got to look at certain people and ask what 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 do they offer? Yeah. Because I hear you. It, 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 we've gone beyond the point now. We've gone beyond the point now of saying, well, you know, a life is a life. And, and no, there are only so many resources available. And mm -hmm. also that individual that is disruptive. And you now that includes those narcissists that mm -hmm. are lower echelon. The world doesn't need them in the way it doesn't need lazy people. So I, that, what, I can't disagree what, with what's you. What's their contribution? And so basically, if you've got two individuals, they need to be they need to be able to prove that they can bring a life into the world that they will bring yeah. up properly, that they won't demand resources from the state for, that they won't uh, create basically a troublemaker that causes problems in school, that mm -hmm. is uh, going to cause difficulties with regard to criminality, etc. So that they add rather than they take away, because unfortunately there are far too many people. Um, that yeah. take away. I can't disagree with you at all. Does that make me a narcissist, HG, for agreeing with you on that and seeing that no, the I same way? I never felt like a lazy person, and there are a lot of people that just um, suck the well, energy see, this out is of the everything. Thing. You and I can both con condemn the hooligan that smashes up a bus stop. Mm -hmm. We might, do you, it for but different for different reasons, reasons, right? Yeah, yeah, we do it for different reasons, but we can both condemn them. It's interesting because I, I know. I agree with so much of what you say in our interviews, man, mm. that it makes me so, wonder. <laughs> it, it, it will come from a different place. Yeah. It's interesting, though, but how the just two Just because meet. I'm a narcissistic psychopath doesn't mean that I want a world that's utter chaos. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer order, but it must be my order. What would a world look like if you were at the helm? How would you have well, it? Well, if I was at the helm, uh, first of all... Um, the football team Manchester United would be disbanded. <laughs> uh, 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 that's priority yeah, number one, of course. But what would be the second priority? <laughs> Essentially, I would look to create a society that would be similar to that in Brave New World. Okay, that so that's where we differ. That would be allocated certain roles, and mm -hmm. they would be content within those roles. So I wouldn't be saying, "Oh, that. you must now be a slave, and you're utterly miserable as you work in a toxic environment." No. I recognize that that individual is going to be more productive if they think this is what I was born to do. Because mm -hmm. the, they wouldn't know any better. For me. Yeah. So to do that. And so it would be where, where people would be assessed. I would look to have some method of evaluation to determine, mm -hmm. is this person going to contribute mm -hmm. in a meaningful way to society? Mm -hmm. And if not, let's just get rid of them. I can't and argue so, with that. <laughs> Then they, then, then they can have a particular role. And I'm interested in art and literature. I was just going to ask you about that. Things. So have them flourish. I'm interested in film and television and good writing. So let all of those things flourish. Mm -hmm. I can intellectually appreciate a landscape, preserve those things. The largely, so much, much of it stems from, I, I actually find most people irritating. And so I would rather get rid of a majority of people, save where I recognize you've got to have them so the provision of cert certain things get done. Mm -hmm. Well, that'd be the only reason that they'd be tolerated. I really appreciate you being honest and upfront about that because, like I said, audience, it's really good to know the other side and to hear how the narcissists, who often, as we talk about, get in positions of power, uh, how mm -hmm. they operate and how they see things and why Brave New World and... Um, Orwell's 1984 were perhaps not necessarily uh they seem like more like non-fiction I, I actually have into. I've actually created a sort of manifesto which really I don't doubt you have you're going to do videos mm -hmm. on it you're going to do a, a book on it what do you what do you mean by that well I I, I might talk uh, what I might do is do a series of videos on what my manifesto would be for if we could that call it Tudor world what it would look That'd like and then we, we can talk about it uh, on one occasion to say that if, if I was the ultimate authority and had that unbridled power to make it so um 
And many people, just as you have done, would actually find themselves in huge agreement with me. Yeah, which is weird. It, it, it's not the case that I am this random lunatic, mm -hmm. um, but rather I would bring uh, order where it's required. I understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I would love there, to see that. Yeah, and there are many of my kind who create the disorder that I dislike, and mm -hmm. I would find it entertaining to ensure that they were crushed. So, HG for point, president, man. Maybe we can get rid of a lot of the bullshit. Remember, it'd have to be world. I, I would take you over freaking what the options that we have in America, which is just like one narcissist versus another, and people still go well, out and vote for these jackasses. There, but the, the bar isn't that high, is it? So, <laughs> no, it's not. So, I guess that wasn't really a compliment, but you know, it's coming from the heart, my man. I understand. Seriously, I, I I like that manifesto that you described a hell of a lot more what's on the table. And since you want to crush all the other ones and be the ultra, perhaps mm -hmm. you would be the ultimate disinfectant if you were the freaking president, man. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Well, it's 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 detailed, uh, this manifesto that I've Really? Written. You've been working you know, on it? it? Yeah, it, it covers the economy. It covers immigration. Holy it covers shit, uh, the environment. It covers space exploration. It covers the sovereignty of nations and so on and so forth. So there's it's, uh, quite the body of work. When will you have some something like that where we could? I'd love to discuss that with you. Is that in the near horizon where we might actually be able to talk about some of that? Well, it's a matter material? of whether uh, it's a matter of whether I choose to share it. Um, I, see. I, I think that I would do so because I think it would prompt um, considerable debate. And, and it would be part of your more, legacy. More uh, yes, and more, more people, I, I would safely say now that if I was to sort of provide that manifesto and people to, were to digest it, that more people would agree with it than be against it. Interesting. Very if interesting. If they approached it with logic and not emotion, mm -hmm. they did that mm -hmm. in the way that I've taught them to assess situations and assess information, more people. Some at first would say, oh, I find that a little bit difficult to stomach. But once you've got over that initial emotional reaction to it, you would recognize that what I'm what I'm explaining would work. If and when you're willing to share that, I would love to take that up and we'll see what people have sure. to say because that sounds, I'd really like to hear that. Yeah. As we roll down on the hour, we're 50, a little over 50 minutes in. Yeah. That was fucking fascinating, by the way. Why don't we just uh, kind of lead it out on this, HG? So there sure. wasn't much to say about the immersion and what you just talked about is all the detail basically of what um i had questions on anyways but so okay. for from the ages of 23 to 24 up until the way i woke up is a well before i get to that let me just say i was in for about 10 years as a hardcore kool-aid drinking 100 percent manchurian candidate scientologist this was my fucking life i didn't have any friends that knew much about it so they didn't i never got challenged on it and nobody really cared anyways. That was just another weird belief system or whatever. I tried to get friends in. They would reject it, but in a way that was kind of kind or whatever. I had no fucking idea. And what it was like being in Scientology is having five PhDs because the amount of work that you do, the challenges at the courses and the auditing, it's really fucking hard, which makes you feel you can't be a dumbass and be in there. I promise you that. Not, not get up that bridge. So it, of course, is just feeding me with more and more like um, uh, challenges that I'm overcoming. That's part of the catharsis. And then I'm being hypnotized without knowing it. So I feel like I'm going into the subconscious, having all these revelations about my life. I mean, I really felt like I was winning. Finally, mm -hmm. I get a foot in the door. Um, at the age of 33, I finally get cast in a big part on a television show. And then right when that happens, right when I, I sign with a mid-level agent, which was like basically guaranteed to have a career, straight to producers on auditions, it's all lined up. This is everything I worked for HG. And right when that fucking happened, this guy from my acting class, well, I have to back up a little. First of all, I was surrounded uh, even in the acting class where my acting teacher was a well-known acting teacher, not only in Hollywood, but specifically with Scientologists. So mm -hmm. because he just happened, there's a synchronistic series of events that happened here. So because he believed in me and my friend's talent, who was also a Scientologist, he told us that, why don't you go audition at the famous actor studio? This is a place, I don't know if you've ever seen inside the actor studio on TV, but yet. they have yeah. you. Okay. So that's the place where 
you know, it's tough to get in and there's just has this whole, you know, reputation or whatever. So by the grace of God, we got in the fucking first audition and that got okay. me away from the environment of the Scientologist. So now I'm around the, um, Again, I'm not going to use the word that we call outsiders because it means the N word, but I'm around all these scary people all of a sudden at my acting class. So there's a guy named Martin Landau who would be best known for, I mean, he's in a million movies, but Ed Wood, I think he was nominated for or won an Academy Award. And he was an older gentleman that was teaching there. And he took mm -hmm. me under his wing, just like L. Ron Hubbard, the, my cult leader, was my surrogate father figure where I didn't get what I needed from my family. And I could tell them all. Martin Landau yeah. kind of became that replacement for me too, but he was a good guy. So long story short, is he the it was, actor who was in Space 1999? Oh man, you'd have to hit me with a movie I've never even heard of. Space Night no, was that like some? Program. Oh, he did a shit. I'll have to look that up. But uh, actually, I can IMDb him right now while we talk. Um, I don't know about that HG. But uh, actually, it's going to be too much of a pain in the ass. I don't want to lose the flow, but I'll, um, I'll I'll answer that for you on the on the next conversation we do. Oh, he was in Mission Impossible, I believe. That was a major television show he was on, and a couple other ones. But he was just a really loving man, okay. and like just being away from my acting teacher, um, who was a Scientologist, and all those people, and having to confront, you know, being around all these weird people, that was a good thing mm -hmm. for me. So. What happened is, is there was this guy who it would seem like a friendly action what he did, but I believe that he also was a narcissist and um, he was doing this to get back at me and out of jealousy. So he dropped off a stack of books yes. on my doorstep and it, one day to show me that I'm in a cult. He didn't, he knew he was, he found out that I and my friend Nick Lashaway, who has since passed away, by the way, RIP. Uh, he was going to be a big actor and getting out of Scientology kind of drove him mad and he got in a car accident one day. So super fucking sad. This is the price of trying to get away from one of these fucking organizations sometimes. But anyway, so he, um, I believe to kind of get back at me because he didn't think I was going to get out of it. He was always kind of ragging on me about Scientology and I would, per the programming, have to go write this guy up. Even though he wasn't a Scientologist, if anybody said anything negative about Scientology, we report it to the church, just like Orwell's 1984. It's a snitching culture. So he drops yeah. a stack of books off. I was going to go to the church that day and write them up and report it and all this bullshit. But because I was lazy, I just happened to sit there all night. And finally, I go, you know what? I'm going to see what this jackass dropped off. So I grabbed the first book. And literally within about 20 minutes, HG, I knew that my entire life was a lie, to put it in a sentence. And the reason for that is because towards the very beginning, he has this thing called the BITE model, which stands for behavior, information, thought, and emotion. Those, according to uh, cult experts, are the four areas that any cult to varying degrees controls. So mm -hmm. he was, the writer of this book was a uh, ex Mooney, the moon cult, Sun yeah. Moon, I believe, also known as a unification church, huge cult, man. So he was describing the moon cult and other cults. If he was describing Scientology or he said the word Scientology, I was programmed to do what's called a thought terminating cliche. They mentioned Scientology okay. as a cult, slam the book. So because yeah. he didn't mention Scientology and he used this bite model to describe mm -hmm. the moon cult and other cults, I recognized right away, holy shit, they all work the same way. And I, this guy's a liar. So then I jumped on the internet, dove down the rabbit hole, 10 years of understanding who this man is, what the fuck happened, et cetera. So that basically yeah. brings us up to the point where we can dive off in the, and you know, the final part of the escape sure. process. But did you want to say anything about that, that ramble well, right there? What's interesting you say there about the fact that because it didn't say Scientology was a cult, once again, you were able to reach the conclusion yourself. Unless it's all the more wow, powerful. Wow, how synchronistic, my man. Thanks for pointing that out. That's ex that's why it was more powerful and why it stuck, exactly. isn't it? You, yeah. you, rather yeah, than yeah, you yeah, have yeah. the knee-jerk reaction of Scientology is a cult, no, I'm shutting it out. Your mm -hmm. thoughts, if the door was left open, so you were able to work it out for yourself. And therefore, that's, that's why it's all, all the more powerful. And that's you, that's you. I never got that before. That's why I was able to take my life into my own hands and get out of it. And HG, so many people go the methadone route, meaning they become indie Scientologists. They recognize that the current leader of the cult, David Miscavige, was evil, but they still believe in the technology of L. Ron yeah. Hubbard. It takes them yeah. forever sometimes to get out of that. But mm -hmm. that's the key. It wasn't just getting the right information. 
that showed me that that's key because you know they do information exactly. control it, it, it's something very common in terms of when people come to me and they say, I have a friend who I think is involved with the narcissist. What do I do? Or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I have families that come and their son is married to a suspected narcissist and it's causing all manner of problems. And I explain, not only do you have to have the information, but they have to be set to receive that if you, you start go. just sending, they'll close down and they, the emotional fog that they're in will not allow them to penetrate. And for you, that information that you received was able to penetrate because you were able to work it out for yourself and therefore you were receptive exactly. to it. That's what made it self-empowering too. That's such a exactly. great point. I, I have to ask you this to end off because it's a perfect thing you just brought up because we're talking mm -hmm. about the same thing. People ask me on my channel, and I don't know the answer. How do I get someone out of a cult? Because like you said, they have to be receptive and get the right information. And it's the same thing that you're dealing with when you do consultations yeah. every day about people asking you, and they must be begging for a solution. Some people are in desperate situations. They're crying. I need to get my fucking friend out of this abusive relationship. How do I do it? Would you mind ending off by giving us some pointers on how exactly you coach people and handle people to do that? Is there Certainly. any additional you, information? It, it is simply this that you must be armed with all of the information to explain to them what's happening, mm -hmm. that you point them in the direct of my resources so that they know where to go to. Absolutely. And that of course you can be there to provide the emotional support that they will invariably need. And it might be financial support. <laughs> they might be providing with a roof over the head or just a shoulder to cry on. You can do all of the sort of uh, icky, uh, cuddly, touchy, feely things that I don't like. Yeah. The point <laughs> is this. It will never, ever succeed by you trying to tell them. They have to come to you and start talking about the problem. Whether it's, I'm worried about my husband because, or my girlfriend has been doing this to me, they're never going to come and go, I think I'm with a narcissist. Mm -hmm. But they'll come mm -hmm. along and they'll start say, uh, they might just you know, look unhappy and you go, what's the matter? And they'll say, uh, it's my husband. I, I don't know what it is, but he does this, he does that. They're talking let them talk yeah. and if you recognize that that's what they're dealing with what you then need to do is let them continue to talk and say to them i think you may be in an abusive relationship because and not to get heavy with the terminology mm -hmm. you've got to let them start to question the process because that means they're going to be open to the information that you provide them with but if you start preaching at them they'll just close down exactly because right. they're not ready to receive they'll feel like they're a failure because you're telling them that their relationship isn't working. They've got to be able to admit that something's wrong. And then you can be there to say, okay, you're, you're leaving the door open for me now. I'm going to, here's some information. I reckon, I've, I think you should read this. And rather than say, oh, right, so what happened there was that the narcissist needed control over. It would be too much for them to take in. And instead of say, I think you would benefit from watching these videos. Or if you read this book, this will give you some further answers and point you in the right direction. So they, they can go off in their own time and access it without being told this is what it means. Let them work it out for themselves. So when they come along expressing a concern about the way that they're being treated, that is your cue to say, "Here's I think this is what might be happening to you. Here's some information that you'll find useful. And then they can talk about it more with you and you can listen and go, yeah, yeah, I, I think I understand what you're dealing with here. I recommend you read this. Don't don't tell them. Don't diagnose for them. Don't mm -hmm. tell them, oh, so this means this means this means this. It'd be too much for them to take in. Yeah. Just recognize, aha, they're waking up, waking up. Give them some more material that they can wake up to and they can work it out for themselves. And then if they come back to you and say, that was really helpful, do you think... And if they invite your opinion, then you can start to tell them. I see. But they've got to be set to receive. And that's how you do go about it. Thank you so much for that. And also what you said is exactly along the lines of what cult experts say to get somebody yeah. out of a cult. There's just one question I wanted to ask you about that really well said. So there you go, guys, because I get asked this all the time. How do you get someone out of a cult? How do you get someone out of an abusive relationship? Access HG's channel, find out what you're dealing with, and then take those steps. The only other question I would have, because I get asked this a lot, is there anything you can do to initiate it, to drop seeds? When someone's not ready to receive, do you have to just sit back there and wait? 
for them to, you know, come at you with the question, like you said, where you can then slowly jump in. Or is there anything well, you can do to initiate you, it? You can tell that somebody is being abused. You mm -hmm. don't you don't start off by saying to them, you're being abused yeah. because they will retreat from that because of mm -hmm. shame it's and absolutely right. feeling like a failure. It, mm -hmm. It's the open-ended questioning. H how are things at home? Give them the chance to talk. Or well, actually, funny you should mention it, but and then they might start talking to you. So uh, how are things how are things going with Frank? And then they might open up to you. So rather than say, he's treating you badly, isn't he? Closed question. Very easy. They'll go, oh, no, 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 no. He, he just sometimes has a bit of a temper, you know, but he's busy at work. They'll close it down. But, you know, how are you and Frank getting on at the moment? And it's all might, about the open-ended question. Yeah, it gives, them, it gives them an opportunity to talk and then don't feel as though they're backed into a corner. Mm -hmm. And it also is a, is a technique for gaining people's trust let them speak don't tell right. them how it is don't don't presuppose that you know what they're experiencing let them explain and they will naturally open up to you like a flower receiving water yes fantastic advice perfect so don't guys on my channel don't ever ask again how to get somebody out of a cult there it is it's explained there really is no magic formula and like you said you can't preach prom i promise you guys i've nope. tried it you cannot preach and, and it's also recognizing that in some instances somebody just isn't ready to be rescued yet. Exactly. Got, so you, you don't, you can't it. force it. Yeah. I'm glad you said that. You can ask that open-ended question, and you'll be able to find out if they're ready to receive or not. But oftentimes, yeah. you can't save, you can't play God. You can help, but no, you have uh, to wait for somebody to be you, open for your own sake. You can't get yourself yeah. involved because of the impact it'll have on you. You must look Fantastic to your own defenses, point. ensure that you're in a in a good position. Because what can often exactly. happen is. Many of the people that I speak to, understandably mm -hmm. uh, buoyant and delighted by the freedom that they've obtained through my information, want to share the love, which is absolutely mm -hmm. fine. But if they go running around seeing narcissists left, right and center and start saying to people, I think you're with a narcissist, I think you're with a narcissist, it's actually not good for their ongoing um, freedom because they'll often do that within maybe a month or two of having worked out what's yeah. going on. And they become too immersed in dealing with narcissists again, which is contrary yeah. to their no contact regime. Fantastic point. I want to say that you're describing it, what happens when I woke up out of Scientology. I wanted to rescue everybody. You run yeah. around like a chicken with your head cut off. And that's natural for anybody to go through that phase. But you learn eventually you're not to play God. It takes an emotional toll on you if you try to save exactly. everybody. And you can't you anyway. So it's a fruitless. Mask on first. There you go. Perfect. Get your shit, your own house in order. And then you also won't be so frantic to get somebody mm -hmm. else out because what you also have to ask yourself, like you're pointing out, are you doing it for the right reason? Do you need that? I needed my parents to get out so I could continue living. But once I yeah. got my own house in order, the franticness to have to save mm -hmm. them to get them out diminished. And then you can go at it rationally. You know exactly. what I mean? Fantastic. That's just so such a fantastic interview and some really solid advice there, HG, on not only how to get out of a cult, but an abusive relationship. And as we talk about in this series, they're basically mirrors of each other. Indeed as are. we end off here, would you mind telling people um, where they can get your services, what you offer, and anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Certainly. So having listened to what I've had to say, if any of you want help dealing with a situation where you believe that you're dealing with a narcissist and you want guidance and understanding, you can access uh, my videos on the channel that Doug pointed out at the beginning. So that information is there. You can also read on my blog, which is narcsite, N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E dot com. And there are uh, a Facebook page and Instagram and Twitter uh, with H.G. Tudor, the Ultra, which uh, contains the various videos and articles that I produce. And you will also find in the menu bar at narcsite.com and in the video descriptions, links that will take you to my services so you can speak to me. If you want help in unraveling a situation, you can use the narc detector to determine that somebody's a narcissist. You can do the empath detector on yourself to find out what you are. Um, so there's a range of services that can be found and you'll also be able to access thousands of videos and blog articles gratis. Fantastic. And for those watching on my channel, Days But Not Confused, as always, there's always a link in the description box of everything that HG just mentioned. My friend, I really appreciate it and I very much look forward to the next one. And I just the giving Absolutely. of your time has been so valuable, my friend.
You're most welcome, though. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thanks, man.